Uh, so we'll get started. Joseph, the as we're thinking through today's clubhouse, and and if you're listening to this afterwards on the replay, or if uh, or on the your favorite podcast player, uh, we do these every Friday on an app called Clubhouse uh, that you, anyone can download around the world. And every Friday at 7 a.m. Pacific time, it is uh, a bit more open for uh, Q and A, a little more free form than our other conversations. And as we prepared for this one this week, uh, I was I really wanted to dive into the the concept of of gratitude uh, philosophically over the last five to ten thousand years uh, that Vedanta has has uh, expounded on on gratitude specifically this line which uh, floored me the first time I heard it from you um, do you mind do you mind just starting with this line of gratitude and desire cannot coexist uh, for us listeners and and the meaning behind it yeah so I would you know probably add a, a phrase at the end gratitude and desire cannot coexist in a given moment. Mm. So they can definitely coexist. You can be grateful in the morning and desire ridden at night. I think we all have that experience or vice versa. And that probably greatly oversimplifies it. You could go to a dinner and be grateful and then desire ridden and then grateful and then desire ridden and then grateful and desire. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're all, everybody's psychotic in that way. Um, actually, um, Right. So, uh, I mean, you know, Swami uh, famously says uh, that, well, he uh, he loves to quote Eric, who's our friend here, the yoga teacher, Eric Pascal, who he's, he's famous for saying, we're all insane. Everyone's insane. And Swamiji loves that and l smiles and laughs every time Eric says it. And he says, this is the guy, only guy who's understood what, I've, what I'm teaching. <laughs> Everyone thinks you're ba we're basically okay. Everyone's mm -hmm. like, I'm okay, but I could be a little more spiritual. Eric's like, no, 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 no. We're, we are insane. Absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. We're just not all talking to ourselves openly. The difference in the people on the beach here who talk to themselves that, that scream at the, the waves and, you know, whatever. There's people screaming in, insane on the beach here in Santa Monica. The only difference between them and us really is they do it out loud. So um, mm. we just have a little bit more intellect. Everyone's constantly chopping their own piece into pieces by this. This is one example of how we do it. We'll be grateful for a moment, but then it could be a little more desire and then grateful for a moment and, and a little and then desire constantly on like a millisecond uh, type of uh, time frame back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So desire is a thought flow uh, that is a company, is agitation. It's agitation in the mind, born of ignorance, to gain something that we don't have or we, that we think we don't have. <laughs> Gratitude, when you are grateful, you are aware of, knowledgeable of, not ignorant of your fullness, your completeness, all that we've been given already. So these two can't coexist in the same moment. This is the point. If you're, if you're grateful, if you are, it doesn't mean that I'm so grateful, God, thank you, like on your knees next to your bed and some silly idea like that. It's just an awareness of the complete benefaction of, of blessing that's raining down on us all the time, it's beginning with the fact that you exist, that very... Mm -hmm very existence itself is the first thing to be aware of, which we completely discount. And then we just got to have that pair of shoes or just got to have that new car. And this is our insanity. We live on a spaceship floating on the outer reaches of a galaxy somewhere on the outer reaches of space in a tiny, perfect bubble of oxygen and barometric pressure and all this stuff. That's ridiculous uh, how perfect it is, you know? And, uh, we're more concerned about, you know, whether Kim Kardashian uh, wore Marilyn uh, Monroe's dress well or not, or whether Amber Heard is actually um, 
you know, abused or Johnny Depp is lying or or vice versa. Completely I, involved. In I this almost mad, clicked. In this I almost clicked on that yesterday. The Kim Kardashian thing. I'm and I'm <laughs> and I'm not that entranced by it. But oh, five million dollar dress. All oh, that. That's what what a five million dollar dress looks like. So you're you're totally no matter how how the morning might start. Yeah, five hours into the day, no telling what what will be entranced by. Entranced, involved, and that that complete involvement makes us ignorant of the inherent fullness that we are and on an absolute level and that we enjoy on a relative level. And uh, therefore, we get lost in desire. We all do it. We all get lost in desire and attachment, craving for something more. Without even, even if you make it even more mundane, just okay, I recognizing how many things we've already been given, you know, how many things that we've already uh, enjoyed, you know, like, I, okay, I'm just gonna try and make it real time, just like to, mm -hmm. for relevant, you know, real time news. Right now, I, I was this whole thing about Roe versus Wade that's going on and abortions mm -hmm. and all this in America. What, what's, I mean, aside from the issue itself, a fascinating thing is how many people it is impossible for them to think of driving to the next state for an abortion. And that's a real thing. That's a real thing for a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. how, that they can't, it's, it's actually not possible for them to, they've never left Texas. You know what I mean? And like, if you mm -hmm. live in the middle of Texas, which is one of these states to go to, to, to New Mexico or somewhere where you can legally have an abortion, is inconceivable and like maybe once or twice in their life they'll do it and you and and like I, i've driven la to texas three times in the last two years and i'm about to do it next week and uh, you know when you start even just counting your your very mundane blessings as it were and not counting it's like these gratitude journals and stuff is like gosh man it's so it's so nauseating uh but that it's an awareness it's awareness of just what we've been given that that there are 600 million people in the world today who have to walk more than two miles every day to get a bucket of water to bathe in drink in wash their dishes in 600 million people right now on the same planet mm -hmm. that we're living and if you but there's buildings uh, in new york city where people can turn on a tap 40 floors above the ground and get right. water pouring into their house. And they'll wait until it gets warm enough before they use it. <laughs> and they just let the waste go. I, I'm not saying we should be wasteful, but it's it's just when we start to think and analyze and, and become even relatively on a very mundane level like that, aware of what all we've be, been given, you know, um, then you, in that moment, in that moment, while you're aware, you're not full of desire. You're not agitated. You're not, you're not disturbed. So these two can't, at the same moment, they can't exist. But then you can forget that and get involved in it and, and get caught up in another desire and uh, feel like, woe is me. Um, you know, so something right. like that. The, the practicality of, of this notion, this observation that gratitude and desire cannot co coexist in my life has been, it's been, pretty remarkable to one to hear that and say wow that's that's right just self-test it you know kick the tires on it can you sit down um and think of the things to be grateful for all of the, this innumerable uh, list of of perfect things that have come together just to exist much less whatever whatever you have to be grateful for beyond just existence the there is no room for desire. Like there is no, like you said, that in that moment, it's one of the great things of, of the mind, at least in a moment, it can only focus on one thing. Now, obviously the oscillation four seconds later, uh, seeing something shiny, seeing something walk by the window and like, oh, that was that, or a cool car drive by. It's so easy for me to be taken out of that. But in that moment where I'm, intentionally being a little bit more aware it's it's so useful to then when i notice myself in 
and moments of desire. It's it's like it's like it's uh, this pretty simple trick of sorts of getting myself out of that desire back to at least some some moment of peace when I start to reflect and and try to grow that awareness of of gratitude. Could you say that gratitude and stress could not coexist in that moment as well? What do you mean by stress? Unfulfilled desire. So someone that is feeling not desire, uh, and uh, but maybe they're feeling overwhelmed and stressed. Is it the same? I would imagine it's the same kind of equation that those two cannot coexist. But I don't want to. I don't want to assume. Yeah, I mean, there's no stress without desire. Stress is the mental agitation caused by unfulfilled desires in the mind. That's the definition of stress. The mental agitation caused by unfulfilled desire in the mind. If there's no unfulfilled desire in the mind, there's no stress. So they coexist. In that way, sure, if you are looking to relieve stress, um, get out your passport and think about the pleasure of all the international travel you've had in your life. I'm just making up examples, you know, mm -hmm. um, think about the, the finest six restaurants you've eaten in, in the last three months. Think of the health of your children, of the, the bank balance that you enjoy of the years you've lived disease free. I, you can go on and on of the planet that you live on. That is, uh, got a moon that's the perfect distance from the earth to give just the right amount of tides to turn the churn the oceans just a much just enough to keep the oxygen carbon dioxide i mean it's ridiculous why is the moon and this is the moonfall movie it, it there's a i'm not going to give it away you got to watch it it's so good <laughs> but why why is the moon exactly the perfect size to perfectly eclipse the sun what are the odds it's absurd mm. And this, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, it, it, if it was, it, and, and this has all kinds of implications that allow life on Earth to be the way it is and why it is. And the title of the movie is Moonfall. Um, so you can tell Michael I'm blowing up his movie here on Clubhouse. Uh -huh. um, it, the, if the moon falls, <laughs> there will be issues. <laughs> you know, the uh, Santa Monica will be underwater right quick. High tide will be 40 feet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or low tide will be negative 80 feet and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we're, we're living in this completely perfectly balanced situation at all times. And yet we're like really upset if somebody else got the last pair of shoes down at the independent shop on, on Main Street. I mean, have you seen the lines for that shop? It's crazy. The mm -hmm. people line up at eight, six o'clock in the morning for the latest pair of Nikes. I saw a full on brawl there the other day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like because some guy was cutting in line and i'm like are you kidding you know for a pair of shoes and not to mention people kill each other for shoes stress desire lack of awareness complete ignorance this is this is the theme everyone's insane we're all in uh, completely the, nice. so that store it's called undefeated and and oh sorry might, undefeated yes sorry, sorry. no no and, and, and listeners might know that that brand that's that street brand and What's interesting is I know the founder of that, Brandon, um, he isn't interested in this stuff at all. <laughs> he, he was a programmer and um, developed a, built a, a few websites. And then a friend that was, that was building Undefeated asked for some help. And so he helped out and just realized, okay, this is a, as much e-commerce as it is in person and uh and we really need to up level the e-commerce so then after a while he just became the person running it from his from his bedroom uh it's a, it's a huge brand but he just runs it from his bedroom extremely nice um uh, introverted founder but has no interest in in this stuff at all but understands business understands incentives understand scarcity understands humans i mean that's what he really understands is humans and yeah. he's sitting peacefully in his bedroom <laughs> he said he works on the business like 15 hours a week uh, uh 
peacefully in the business. Well, people are, sounds like having a, a, a brawl, waking up at six, waking up at five to drive over to be in line by six for the latest you know, issue of some shoe. It's, it is the person designing the system is just, is just man- manipulating the emotions of, of us. I mean, and, and there's no, there's no high minded view on that because I, I'm, I get manipulated by, by these types of the exact same tactics um, all the time. Um, if I'm not aware of, of what is happening within me. And, and we're not saying, we're not saying don't want the shoe. We're not saying don't, want the next international travel or the the prize reservation at the fancy restaurant or whatever we're not saying don't have a desire we're, it just should be governed that's all i mean ultimately yes it is don't have desire ultimately but that that's completely unapproachable for most people for 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 99 of people saying don't have desire is a if it's absurd if they agree it means they haven't understood what the words mean so uh, the, the relatively have the desire, but but at the same time, don't get completely involved in these things, in anything, any of these things. Maintain a, a healthy awareness, not even like people get the wrong idea that this is like a gratitude journaling commercial. I that, please that, that, that's so nauseating to me. Instead of that, like just have an awareness, have a have a reflection of what all uh, benefaction that we enjoy. Uh, it makes us much less uh, craving, or much less caught up in that. It's called trishna in Sanskrit. It means craving. It, you get don't get so deluded by the craving that you'll be having a fist fight on Main Street because some guy tried to cut the line. For the latest pair of shoes i mean it's just absurd you know and mm. uh and and it happens i mean th- these are mundane silly examples but i mean it happens on a grand scale uh and uh it ends up in wars and and genocides and goes all the way that way or it's just couples destroying themselves or just watch the johnny depp trial my god if, it, if there's not vedanta watch that for vedanta this this lady Amber Heard. So? We are. Oh, we're, it's we're just the you. mind. It's just the mind writ large. I mean, these people have everything, you know. And uh, the 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 amount of stress and violence and anxiety and and abuse. I mean, it's just hectic. And it's being now you can watch it live on YouTube. Her describing, him describing, it total involvement. So much stress. So much lack of gratitude so much lack of 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 awareness of what of the rarity of 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 these people's lives you understand i mean they're talking about uh, doing drugs and having fist fights on private jets and you know this kind of stuff you just it's absurd it's 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 a uh, it's such an exaggerated uh, uh thing that it makes it so clear how crazy the mind is that's all you know, ours are just most people don't have the resources to destroy themselves that fully. Right. I understand. Unfortunately, mo- see, the mind is like fire. We, we've said this many times. The Gita says the mind and desire is dus porena nalena cha, which means unfillable like fire. The mind will never, ever by itself stop burning. The intellect has to give it a direction, has to do it. But the thing is, most of us don't have that much fuel to burn. Thank God. We're protected by our poverty or our non-excessive wealth, right? Mm-hmm. These people have, have, so many, have so much resources. That guy's getting paid $20, $30 million a film, right? And it's a, at his peak. So uh, he's got all this money, all these resources. So they have the fuel to completely destroy themselves. Uh, and they do. And and the the just the horrendous stories that they're telling on this this trial. You watch some of the highlights; it's absolutely riveting stuff, to be honest. And uh, and and it's terrible and sad and tragic, but it's not. It's actually not that different than what everyone's doing to themselves on a daily basis 
by allowing the desires to completely destroy our awareness of the fullness that we have, the fullness that we are just by breathing, just by being right. able to see. I was walking yesterday and on the uh, out walking because, as you know, I'm having a, a bit of a back issue, so I can't surf. And it was like beautiful. And I was a little bit thinking to myself, oh, gosh, man, this I wish I could surf this weekend and I can only walk. I was having some thought like that. And then I walked by this guy, this man, who had these big heavy walking shoes on and this this metal brace that came out the back of his shoe and latched onto his calf. And so every step for him was a thing. Mm -hmm. And I immediately slapped myself, you know? I was just like, wow, you know? Okay, I can walk freely here in the beautiful sunlight of Santa Monica. This guy has... Uh, has to wear these something happened to him he has to wear these braces just to put one step in front of the other you know there's that uh that thing about like i i what was it that quote about maybe parl can help us the thing about uh uh i i was lamenting my life with in in something about like I, I didn't have a car or something but then i saw a man who had no feet there's some quote like that you know so Mm -hmm. The the moment we recognize the fullness just in our mundane uh, capacity, our mundane uh, benefits that we enjoy, we're we're a bit liberated from this. And how far are these people away from that? You know, I mean, uh, the the they end up in in suicide. They end up uh, why why do these why do people with such resources, such lives, such beauty, and everything kill themselves? You know. Right. Why does that happen? Because they they burn so fully that that life is absolutely um, unbearable. The life itself is unbearable, which is ridiculous given the lives that they have. I mean, the guy has an island, and he is he is uh, fighting and screaming at this lady, and it's so much that he's making his children cry. They're so scared. Why? Because he has to sell his yacht to J.K. Rowling. That was actually like in one of the clips I saw with my lunch yesterday. This mm -hmm. was the fight. This was Johnny Depp's agitation. He was so upset. Why? Because on their private island in the Bahamas or Bermuda or whatever, he is he's agitated because of his debt that he's gotten himself into and therefore has to liquidate his yacht and J.K. Rowling's buying it. And he's so upset that he's falling over drunk and abusing this lady and making his kids cry because he's being such a monster. Like, this is just, if the aliens came down and they would just look at this and be like, are you serious? Like, this is like one of the most famous humans in the history of humanity, if you take it that way. One of the wealthiest people ever, one of, whatever. And he's, yeah, I mean, there's, he's at that percentage, right? And this is it? This can happen to anybody. That's the point. Also. Uh, Johnny, uh, Parle says, um, the quote is, I complain that I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. I mm -hmm. complain that I had no shoes till I met a man who had no feet. So anyway, these are all just intellectual um, exercises and reflections to uh, help us get liberated from not necessarily desire itself. That's a bigger exercise. Actually liberating yourself from desire requires a heck of a lot more than just a bit, little bit of gratitude. But it does, uh, gratitude will is a relative practical tool to uh, help us rid ourselves at least of the inflammation around desire. Desire is like a wound in the mind. And it's like, okay, a wound is one thing, but if you can govern the inflammation, it'll, you'll have less pain, you'll have less manifestation of it, you'll be a nicer person, you'll be better for humanity and all that. So. Right, you could have the same, the same, uh, I've got a herniated disc, but if I treat my back right, I have immense range of motion. There same injury, go. but without the inflammation. Sometimes right. when I'm going out to surf, maybe an Advil as well. It's like my back is, has no injury. And right. yet, you know, the inflammation will come back, especially if I, I, I realize this week, uh, maybe last week, but if I consume a lot of sugar the next day, back hurts so bad. Mm. And, and it was after, um, 
yeah, giving up sugar for, for Lent that then I started to reintroduce them and I was, it was just blew my mind. I was like, Oh my God, mm. this is now, this is, uh, I it is, uh, very black and white now. The, I want to touch on the, the, and, and for listeners or folks checking out, um, this episode afterwards, Joseph has been studying Vedanta, um, a 5,000 plus year old philosophy for the last 25 years. And, um, and as my teacher within Vedanta, and so I want to touch on, uh, the, the right practices of gratitude. Uh, but I first would love to, um, just have you outline what is the downfall of desire? What is, why is that something to be aware of, to, to move away from? And, um, and then you mentioned intellect for the listeners listening for the first time and for someone like myself that needs to hear it thousandth time of just, we have a body, a mind and an intellect, perhaps a central contribution of Vedanta is that we have these two internal equipments, a mind and an intellect. Um, could you first talk about desire and why that is something to, um, what is philosophy uh, say about desire? And then, and then talk a little bit about uh, the role of the intellect you know, within this conversation. Yeah. So um, as you said, every human being has a body, which is a vehicle for the uh, inner personality, the, the inner, the subtle body, which is composed of two equipments, mind and intellect. Um, and the mind is desires, attachments, uh, emotions, feelings, all the flowy stuff. The intellect is the ability to reason, judge, decide, uh, penetrate into the unseen, what is unknown to, um, be able to project uh, beyond the what's in front of us. Um, this is this is the intellect. The intellect, if it's developed, if it's strong enough, has the capacity to guide the mind, which is full of desire and attachment and feelings and all that stuff. It has the capacity to guide the mind where we choose to guide it. That's said to be like the banks of the river um, guiding the water in the river. Now, uh, uh, the, it's obvious that the, the, it's a problem if our desires completely overtake us, then we are no longer governing our personality. And we get stressed out, we get all kinds of problems, and we uh, end up even to, the, to this great extent of destroying ourselves, destroying our health, destroying our wealth, destroying our relationships. So for most people, that's enough to know. And that, that's, that, that, trying to get a hold of that is a life's work of just trying to get basic control over the insanity of our mind and what all negative things it does to us. That, that itself is plenty of work. Um, for the people that are actually serious about knowing the truth of life, um, who are actually interested in spiritual unfoldment and development uh, for those people then you've got to begin to remove desires completely so um, the desires uh, the desires are the desires are um, the the limitation that that separates us from our godhead from our pure consciousness Sorry, I just have a visitor here. So uh, the the desires are that which separates a human being from their original nature. Human being minus desires equals God. So this is projected, this is portrayed in all of the varying spiritual traditions. Um, for In Hinduism, uh, these are desire is personified as the asuras, the demons. In Buddhism, desire is is personified as Mara. Um, in uh, in uh, Islam, uh, desire is also there. 
uh, desire is is personified, shaitan. of course, shaitan. Of course, uh, in Christianity, it's Satan. So these, there's no red skinned guy with horns that is, uh, you know, <laughs> living in a fire pit underground or whatever. This is a child stories, you know, cartoon stories. They are these are stories that are symbolic of the corrosive, destructive power of desire that separates us from our original nature, which is pure consciousness. Even the Yoga Sutras, uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, if people are, you know, in, interested in that that uh, school of thought, even in the yoga uh, uh, philosophy tradition, it defines yoga in the second sutra of the book. At the very beginning, defines yoga as yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is when the vrittis, the agitations in the chitta, which is the mind, are uh, niroded <laughs> to for like, to to ingle, I don't know mm-hmm. to make it into English. It, it, in other words, when there's no more fluctuation in the mind, no more agitation in the mind, a person is said to be in in yoga which is when there is no desire. It's not just by stretching or standing on your head or sitting like a pretzel. And nothing wrong with it also. I uh, uh, love to sit on the floor like a pretzel. So we're not against it. But uh, that itself is not yoga, you understand. So anyway, this is the bigger picture of desire and what it has to say. The And I think it's probably no no more melodramatic or no more dramatic way of articulating it than uh, man plus man minus desire is God that is it is not this this just like one of eight different aspects of life today desire and and then there's going to be a commute and then there's going to be work and then there's going to be some desire but it's that is the thing that is the conceptual gap between divinity and and ourselves and and i think it's uh further illustrator in the personification of of desire as something like satan which we can grow up and and think no it's these 10 different commandments it's these it's these rules it is these laws that we break that introduces us to hell introduces us to this this uh, satanic diabolical figure and yet it's um it's actually no it's far simpler than that it is as simple and yet as uh as difficult to wrestle with as as desire it is desire i think that was actually crucial for me in my understanding of vedanta or eastern and, and vedanta being the source of all eastern philosophy coming back to this concept of Desire is the issue. It's not one of my issues. It is the issue. Um, yeah. And and the stress or the running my last company. Oh my God! There was so much stress. I've touched on it before, but it is. Uh, it was. I mean, it sent me into a tailspin of eighteen months of burnout and depression because there was. And when I look back, it was just such I was a ball of desire um, mm. no matter what we were accomplishing it was how do we go even bigger how do we I mean it started with me sitting on the couch thinking what would be the biggest idea in the world okay Facebook mm. is big so I'm gonna I'll build the social network of money that'll be even bigger than Facebook and got kind of far with it before before uh, absolutely burning out and I let, I also want to underscore comparing it to fire you know it's uh almost every other appetite has its limits especially human appetite you cannot you know it's i think in in texas there's that stop for the 72 ounce steak or something um Mm -hmm. (laughs) there there are the limits the people that can eat that they can't eat a thousand ounce steak but fire is such a great uh metaphor because it has absent absolutely no limits it, as you touched on in a previous episode i remember you saying like fire never stops and says okay i'm full let me go out it will rage on until it is 
you know, exhausted by uh, one thing or another, water, lack of oxygen, but it will not stop. And that's not by it, by it, not by itself. Yeah. Right. Not, not by itself. And that's, uh, it's worth underscoring because this, this thing called desire that we could be listening to on a clubhouse on a Friday morning and just think, oh, that's like, this is an interesting thing to explore for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, pop in, think about it for 10 minutes later in the day. It's not an interesting thing to explore. It is a force that will rage on in our lives, or does rage on in our lives um without without stopping unless there is something uh, to stop it and so the um and it, it is the the destruction it is the destroying force in our lives not one of them or not something to to uh, be mindful of it is the destructive force in our lives so we've chatted about desire and then I want to open it up for a Q&A after after this but um so on the things that can stop that fire what does what does this philosophy say about the things that can stop that fire and both concepts and then also practices in our day and obviously the title of this this room being a a, a nice one of gratitude and, and desire cannot coexist but what what does the philosophy say about uh, the concepts and the practices that can stop that fire yeah. So the, as we said, the fire cannot stop itself. It, it just doesn't have it in it. The mind cannot stop itself. It requires an external agent to do that, which is the intellect, which is reason, which is knowledge, which is understanding. And when it's lacking, the fire burns and burns us up and burns everything down. Like in Shakespeare, which we talk about a lot. So much of the, so many of the tragedies of Shakespeare are like the Johnny Depp, Amber Heard thing. I mean, it's a modern day tragedy. It's totally worth sitting down and watching because it's like, my God, this is what can happen when a mind has all the fuel in, in the world and, and no restraint. This is what you can do to these lives, to your life and the world around you and so many other people that depend on them and blah, blah, blah. So in Shakespeare, like in uh, Julius Caesar, uh, when Mark Anthony uh, lectures to uh, the crowd at the end, uh, he says, O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Judgment is fled to, brutus, to, to brutishness, to being, a, to being brutes. Judgment is lost, and men have lost their reason. And this is what he's talking about. They had this beautiful uh, leader in Julius Caesar, and all these guys with their desires, Brutus and all of his friends, uh, were allowed themselves to be overpowered by hunger for the power or whatever, led them to do it, lost sight of the bigger picture and end up taking out this benevolent leader that everyone loved, you know? And then later on, uh, which is very relevant to this, uh, to this topic of gratitude, uh, he says, uh, when noble Caesar saw Brutus stab, saw him stab, when, when Caesar saw his friend Brutus coming to stab him. Ingratitude more strong than traitor's arms. That's what vanquished him. It was the ingratitude itself was more than he could take. And mm -hmm. so the, it's highlighted in Shakespeare literally what we're talking about. Brutus was, it, it was such an idiot to not understand the benevolence of his friend Caesar. And he destroyed that, literally killed him. So they exaggerate these things in these tragedies to make us see. We do not recognize our benefactors. We don't, it's one of the worst things that happens in, in humanity is that we don't recognize the very people around us that are trying to help us. And we, we push them away because they may challenge us or they may inconvenience us or they may make us uh, question what we're doing. We don't value our, our benefactors. And if we do value them, we only value them 10% of what we should value them for. And then we court the people that hurt us. We court the things that hurt us. We court the things that are not serving us. This is the sin and madness of mankind, as he says in, anywhere else. But ingratitude more, is more strong than traitor's arms. It's that thing that broke Caesar. He couldn't handle the ingratitude of his friends. 
and his the ingratitude of his of his these people who he was serving. You understand? Because they had been they had lost their reason. Their reason had fled to brutish beasts. The the and men had lost their reason. He said. So anyway, I'm just elaborating. Uh, all of these po- all of these epics in Shakespeare highlight this. You understand? So what to do is to get the reason back, to think, to to analyze, to understand why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I having this desire? What is the actual value in this thing that is making me crazy, that is making me destroy my family life, destroy my business? This, what is this greed and lust and all these things that that destroy people's lives? excessive sensuality and why am i allowing it to do this to me what is the actual value in any of these things this is the only way to do it is to analyze threadbare to analyze it threadbare and understand what's the actual value in this thing i'm craving what it, and versus the value of the things that i have and the people that are around me that may not be as exciting or may not be as as uh stimulating or whatever but or might challenge us. I mean, yeah. that's one of the or challenge us. Yes, you say yes. it's a uh, it's an exaggeration in something like Julius Caesar. It's hard to exaggerate something like this, the trial that you're mentioning the the Depp and, and uh, Amber Heard trial. It's hard to exaggerate that of three hundred fifty million dollars to nothing in a five year span, mm. um, and. And it's not the betrayal of friends. It is themselves. Uh, and it's, it is, it is so it, it, it actually doesn't require uh, so much of an exaggeration. And I think you. Oh, because their life it. is so exaggerated already is the point. I mean, nobody lives like that, right? I mean, it, it, there's like how many, what's the, the percentage of human beings that live anywhere near like that level of a life is, is, but is like, like you nothing, said, you know, but like you said, it's, I think it's, it's far more likely we would all live like that. If we had that fuel, if we had that's the those, point, that's the point. And, yes. Yes. And, and that is one of the things that, and, and there's, I mean, that's obviously so counter everyone's watching it being like, Oh my God, what disasters. I would never do that. Totally. And yet, one of the simplest things that we would do to betray ourselves is you get a little notoriety, a little influence, and you start to say, you know what? I really like the people that build me up, that don't challenge me. Mm. Year after year, you you cultivate that type of community and you have this, this desire for that comfort of, of yes people, as they call them telling you what you want to hear and you have this desire to avoid any discomfort of being challenged. And that is, that is the every person that's, that's listening, not the, um, burn 350 million. Very few people can identify with that, but it, it takes maybe 30 seconds for people to reflect on. Yeah, that's actually, I do push away the people that challenge me. Right. And 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 it's that's one of the one of the things where it's um, that desire it doesn't it's not draped in a you know with a, a red cape and and horns it is so simple it it looks like a donut it looks like the emotional equivalent of a donut of I really like when so and so tells me these things that I want to hear and I really don't like when my sibling tells me what I don't want to hear. So I'm going to get rid of them out of my life. And I'm going to go with this emotional glazed donut. That is my friend, John, that right. really just tells me what I want to hear. Right. And this is Brutus. What was Brutus's excuse? Do you know his excuse, James? No, no. It wasn't. Not that I love Caesar less, but I love Rome more. Mm, yeah. <laughs> He knows, he's saying, I, I love Caesar, but uh, yeah, as you say, the glazed donut, but the power of Rome is so mad, you know? It's like Macbeth d- deciding he can be the king. He loves, the, I love Duncan, but gosh, the king. And I have my wife in my ear 
prodding me to become the king also. So he's got that lady in his Lady Macbeth in his ear, pushing that instant desire. So this is what we do. And coming back to not recognizing our benefactors and being full of ingratitude is because we get lost in the desire for this bigger thing. Not that I love Caesar less, but that I love Rome more. And so we ditch the 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 things and the practices and the people and the 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 waves that are at hand for the sake of some better wave down the beach mm-hmm. you know there's a say in surfing they always say never drive away from good waves and, and we all do it we go to that wave and we're like oh my god it's so good but if it's this good here oh my god it's probably so much better <laughs> <laughs> up the way and then by the time you get there the tide's in and it's lost you know I mean, well, the, it, on certain yeah, time, on certain days, it's it's good to do it. But man, it's really better if you find a good wave, surf them, and it's the same thing here. It's the same well, thing. it is it is that knowledge that uh, that it's it kind of puts out these little fires within us, like that. If if you know it's an adage um, of do not drive away from good waves, then once you hear it. It's, it is so, it's like well, the knowledge bombs that we talk about within Vedanta and uh, the other episodes, you hear it and then it awakens something within you, that intellect within you to apply it. And if you don't hear that knowledge, then you have to come up with that adage on your own, which might take 20, 10 years of surfing to realize, you know what? Actually, every time I drive away from good waves, I end up regretting it. Um, so within these knowledge bombs, you already touched on the fact, the knowledge bomb of, of knowledge bombs that you have this internal equipment, um, the intellect to counter the mind, that, that raging fire, you have it. It's, it's not that you need to seek the water, um, or, you know, pull the oxygen out to, to quell the fire. You actually have that internal equipment, the intellect. Um, what are the, what does the philosophy say? about putting out this this fire of desire what is the concepts and then the the practices on a daily basis that would apply to someone that says okay i recognize um and i see what you guys are saying on the downside of desire here is here's what the philosophy says that i can do about it spend one year understanding you have a mind and intellect i'm talking to most people best thing is Go to Vedanta Academy, do the three-year course, and get a hold of yourself. That's the best thing. Um, there's a three-year course at Vedanta Academy where people, there's a schedule, there's a daily schedule, there's daily knowledge. You practice strengthening your intellect, and get a hold of your mind. That's the best thing. Anyone who's serious will make that happen somehow or the other in their life. I've seen people do it from 18-year-olds to 60-year-olds in all situations. That's the best. Then there's no compromise on that. For a little bit less serious, sign up for the e-learning course, which is the online version of the three-year program at Vedanta Academy. Um, And that can also be done at vedantaworld.org. We're not here to sell it. I'm just telling you that's what it is. And James and I don't benefit at all from that, except to share it. And we're both doing it. So we're talking from experience. Other than that, read Fall of the Human Intellect. If you can't sign up for e-learning, Go to Amazon and find Fall of the Human Intellect. Read it. Study it. Read it every day. When you finish it, read it again. Not like a novel. Read a, read a paragraph 20% of the time and reflect 80% of the time. This is the only way to, to understand how the mind is making a fool of us. How the mind is destroying us. That's the only way to, to understand that. We are a slave to our desires and our minds. The only way is knowledge and understanding and repeated reflection upon it with the guidance of uh, this great tradition of Vedanta. Um, I have Zoom classes people can join. Um, they can send, they can DM us here or they can send a mail uh, to, uh, uh, what is it? Info at yoga for your intellect at gmail. Yoga for your intellect at uh, gmail.com. Yoga for your intellect at gmail.com. They can send a mail. I have, weekly study classes so bottom line is you've got to get knowledge and not just read it once hear it once you've got to reflect upon it think about it again and again 
the practice will follow the knowledge. If you understand that the, your food has poison in it, the moment you really understand, you will put your food, that food in the trash and throw it away. There's no extra step. It's knowledge. Knowledge is as essential for liberation as fire is for cooking. So in this very, in this particular thing we're talking about now, gratitude and desire, like we started at the beginning, re listen to it over and over again. What all things we listed about all the things we can be grateful for. Um, I don't know. Maybe if, if, if you can't handle knowledge, go to a third world country and walk around a slum. Just spend like, spend a week living in a slum in Bombay and you'll be a very grateful person for a long time after that, you know, that, but that's a form of knowledge. But it's a knowledge kind of a dumb way by experience. You don't have to do it by living in a slum, but it'll help. So got it. We've got to get knowledge of, our, of all that we've been offered and not to speak of knowledge of our eternal nature. I mean, that just takes it to another level, but it's probably not practical. But when you when you get into that frequency, you, desire just doesn't happen. You, you can't you won't desire very much because you're constantly reveling in the fact that you is and the very fact that you're conscious, that miracle of consciousness itself, which is itself crazy. But that's the highest level knowledge. But in short, James, to answer you, knowledge, reflection upon knowledge, that's the practice. That's it. And when we truly understand, when it truly sinks in, and when it gets into our bones, then we will live it. Our actions will follow and we will um, we will uh, be liberated from the suffering of desire. So you mentioned um, at the top, just if it's, if you can't do anything else, just reflect on, for a year on the fact that you have two eternal equipments. Yeah. With the, the help of, with the help of, of hopefully at least the text fall of the human intellect, at least re use that text to help you uh mm. analyze what's the mind what's the intellect and get your head around it that itself takes quite a while for people to understand and um i'm saying that after living in the ashram for 10 years that it's still uh uh an effort to remember that these two equipments are driving my life you know so this is not a there's no end to that like okay now i've understood mind and intellect and now i'm going to move on to the higher stuff no 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 there's nothing else the only person who who fully understands the mind and intellect is the person who's self-realized. That's the only one. That's the only person who has a full, clear visibility on mind and intellect is the self-realized person. All the rest of us are, are still victimized by it to some degree. Hmm. It's like uh, then, who, can, who can understand the earth? You can be, you can go up 10 feet and have a certain understanding. You can go up 100 feet to have a certain understanding. When you get to orbit, you're actually understanding what the, that whole planet is, you know, and that, that's the only way to get, the only people who really understand mind and intellect are the ones who are completely out of it. And something I like that you mentioned is even Buddha required several years of, of study oh, yeah. and work. And it a was a decade uh, of it. Yeah, a decade of it. Right. So it's, um, it is not, here's a new practice for, for two minutes a day and you'll be good, uh, within 30 days or you'll see these amazing benefits. Now, having said that you did touch on something that is really specific and helpful, which is a paragraph a day. Um, and, and then the reflection on that paragraph, 80% on the reflection, 20% on the digestion, which is also different than what, we usually jump into a practice, a book, a uh, philosophy, and we're like, I want to consume, 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 and uh, want to underscore the approach you're saying is uh, seems to be reflect four times the amount that you're consuming. Yeah. And, and it can be as simple as a paragraph a day. The other thing that you're um, – mentioning that's 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 really critical was for me was uh that it's daily it's not read this book and then check in 10 days later but as swami was to say it's uh three things um are more critical than anything else question everything don't take anything for granted given and 
today's topic is, is obviously on point there. Don't take anything for granted. And then third, uh, study every day. And right. do you mind talking a little bit about why it's it's daily? It's not a podcast episode a week. Or I read a book back in February that was that quote unquote changed my life. Uh, why daily? Sure. And I'll make this the last point, James. And if folks have uh, any questions uh, about this, they can they can ask us next next week. Or actually, next week there won't be a clubhouse because. I'll be uh, on the road and the reception won't work. But anyway, they can ask us in the next time we meet. Um, Perfect. And because uh, I need to get I need to get out of here soon. Um, I'll, but anyway, sure. the um, uh, the value of daily is that it, it's there's such a bombardment of non wisdom on us, both from within and from without all day long. So it, it, it just builds up. It creates, it's like, it's like boats. If you leave them in the water without taking them out and scrubbing them regularly enough, they get built up of all these kinds of things growing on them uh, from the, from the ocean. So it's a daily polishing of a, the mirror of our intellect. It's like brushing your teeth every day. It's like exercising every day. It's like going to the bathroom every day. All these things we've got to do every day. Otherwise, we build up, and the the um, the layers of the build up become so much that it's almost unretrievable. So uh, the, the there's so much um, low values, so so many desires being forced on us, as it were, from the outside, and so much of our own low thinking by nature that we've if we don't put in a little bit of effort every day, then it just, it gets out of hand. The fire of the mind just gets too strong and it, it burns through everything. So it's that simple. Well, as always, thank you, Joji. Thanks, brother. I really appreciate uh, the time. I'll let you get going. And for folks, uh, go to yfy.co to especially start with episode number one. Um, it's a project I know we're both uh, really proud of. Um, in a healthy way and uh feel free to check in not next week but the week after for our next clubhouse or the replays that are on our club which i think is at 1100 members or so so go check yeah. out more there and uh thanks to parl for all the uh the background yes. support and and shakespearean suggestions because she's english from england so thanks parl and uh yes. everybody follow parl there and um brother check your uh, check your whatsapp i left you a message earlier to talk about what's going on with the surf today and, okay um, yeah we might be might yeah. be getting after some surf yeah. well actually yeah. i'll check whatsapp to see check all it right out. all right everybody, everybody. take and, care and vincat thank you for the kind words uh in the room chat bye everybody bye, bye everybody